Welcome to the New Books Network. Sand, salt, iron, copper, oil and lithium. And uh, Ed Conway has uh, written about them in Material World, a substantial story of our past and future. So that's a very brief introduction, but hello. Hello. (laughs) You've got this uh, very interesting book on these uh, crucial substances. And and you, you, you said... Um, it changed the way, writing it changed the way you look mm. at the world. Why, why is that? Yeah, I mean, it completely did, really. I'm, I, I'm, I cover economics as my day job, and, and normally normally you don't pay that much attention to this stuff, you know, kind of raw materials. It's quite, it's quite low value in terms of its contribution to GDP. And, but, and, and, and to some extent, we kind of have lured ourselves in, into thinking that, that it, it, partly because of that, partly because it's stuff that we don't tend to make that much anymore over here, like the you know, raw materials, turning them into, into physical products. I think we've kind of lured ourselves into, into believing this stuff didn't matter uh, as much and that all, all you needed in the world was kind of a good idea um, and the kind of the dematerialized world of brain cells and all of that uh, would take care of the rest. But I suppose the, the kind of revelation I had, and I know to, to many people that will see like a statement of the obvious, but the revelation I had is that nothing in that kind of world of of services of tech of everything else would be able to function without these very simple materials which we turn into extraordinary things so i mean you know sand gives you glass which which was the the very earliest of the um of the kind of advanced technologies that humankind ever made and yet it's still being used today to make uh, the the photolithography machines that we need to make silicon chips. I mean, from sand, we also have um, we also have concrete, and you can't make cities without concrete. For that matter, you can't really make server centers, so you can't have servers. And the internet itself, you know, we think of it as being this this kind of this thing that's somehow off in the air somewhere. But it's in reality, the internet is a very physical construct. You know, it's a physical pieces of infrastructure. The vast majority. Of, of the kind of transport of data happens on fiber optic cables, which are made of glass for the most part. And if it's not there, then it's in copper, going through copper wires, it's going through server centers, through semiconductors, which are made of silicon. And part of the kind of uh, the exciting thing about this book for me was starting for the first time, I guess, in my career to begin to understand how this stuff actually worked and how we made it. So in some senses, you know, the book is kind of, it's a how the world works book, um, but it's looking at corners that that we don't that are kind of I think slightly underrepresented in, at least in my world of economics. Um, so yeah, it was a total it was a total revelation. And the the deeper I kind of went into it, the more the more relevant it seemed. Not just you know there's there's a lot of history in there, but there's also it gives you this insight into the challenges and opportunities of getting to net zero as well. Because when you start to think about the materials we use to make the world that we live in today, and then the materials we're going to need to make the the, the world of, of with of kind of green tech in the future, well, it's a lot of stuff, and we need to you know think about how we get that stuff out of the ground. And it's easy to be kind of catastrophist about that in pra- in practice. Actually, that the history of you know our exploitation of things shows us that we're quite good at getting this stuff out of the ground when we need to. So we're not going to probably not going to run out of the lithium we need for, for all those car batteries. But even so, it is a very big physical frontier we are kind of facing at the moment. And I think that's been slightly underplayed in a lot of the, the coverage and analysis of, of the moment we're standing in. As, as has arguably the, the, the sheer difficulty of, of getting this stuff. I mean, that's one of the things that your book makes clear, because you go to a lot of the places where these materials are being dug out of the ground in one way or another. And and these are massive enterprises, aren't they, involving thousands of extremely, you know, clued up people uh, working out how mm. to do it. They're, I mean, they're crazy. So I went to quite a lot of mines. But well, the one that was probably the most striking was a place called Chukikamata, which is a, a copper mine in Chile. And it is the world's biggest man-made hole. Well, actually, there's there's a couple of places, you know, there's there's one other place which likes to think it's slightly bigger, but actually I think Chukikamata takes it on, on most different metrics. And it's kind of like a canyon. It is like a canyon that we have dug into the ground purely in order to satisfy our demand for copper. And the amazing thing, I guess, about a lot of these mines is, you know, they've been going not just for decades, but well, but for more than a century. This, this place, Chukikamata, you know, when you look back at the electrical age, so the 
economists sometimes talk about it being the second industrial revolution. It's the electrification. You know, it's a mass, that was a massive, massive shift in terms of our productivity. It's hard to find another kind of moment where we became more productive more quickly because, you know, electricity and power was just one of those technologies which enabled pretty much us to do pretty much everything better. So suddenly, you know, it was because of that that you could have um, elevators that could go up to the top of skyscrapers. So without that, you don't have skyscrapers. We were able to use electricity to kind of replace a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of steam powered machinery that you had in factories. So basically, all factories suddenly became, you know, one, two, three orders more productive than it was before because of electricity. And a lot of the copper that was being, you know, mined to try to provide the, the, the wiring you need for electricity, because you, you can't really have it without copper, um, came from that mine. I worked out that it's about one in 12 of every atom we have ever exploited from the Earth's surface came from this particular hole. And the striking thing about it is that in order to get to net zero, we need to basically electrify everything. So, so you know, this place obviously provided the copper for the first great electrical revolution. Well, we're going through another electrical revolution at the moment, which is that, you know, we need to shift from getting about kind of like, I think it's about kind of 20, 30% of our energy, our primary energy from electricity through to kind of 80%. You basically, you know, all cars are going to be electric eventually or something like it. Um, you need, we're going to have a lot more electricity kind of coursing through the system for heat pumps and everything else. So the amount of wiring you're going to need in the future, if you're going to get anywhere close to all those ambitions, is crazy. It's extraordinary. We need more copper than we ever have done before. And while there's a lot of focus on the kind of sex, sexy, I suppose you could say, materials like lithium, and lithium does feature in the book, you know, our, our ability to, to fulfill all of these big promises we've, gonna made, we've made is also going to depend on getting boring stuff like copper out of the ground. And you need, in order to satisfy those projections from various people, whether it's the International Energy Agency uh, or the Climate Change Committee in the UK, you, you need an extraordinary amount of copper. Potentially, we need another three mines like Chukikamata, the world's biggest man-made hole, another three of them every year just to satisfy that demand. And, and so I don't think anyone has quite kind of wised up to that. And the difficulty is that at the moment, it's getting harder to, to find new copper mines and to get them approved than it was in the past, partly because we've kind of mined out a lot of the easy stuff, but partly also just because the, the, the decent resources that are left are either in places which are dangerous, where there are big kind of geopolitical or, or diplomatic issues. So, you know, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, that has still very high grey copper, but the conditions there are pretty abysmal. Um, and the same thing with kind of various other places. Or, you know, a lot of the copper lies under places that people don't really want to have dug up. I mean, when you look at the grades of copper that we still have left in the ground in Cornwall in the UK, wonderful rolling, you know, hills and beautiful coastlines of Cornwall. Well, under, the, under those hills, there's still an awful lot of copper. In fact, better grades of copper than you find at Chukikamata, the world's biggest hole in the world. And so, um, but there you run into another issue, which is that no one in Cornwall wants to have a massive hulking big copper mine, you know, in, in, in the middle of uh, Cornwall. So there's resistance in terms of, you know, the difficulty of getting stuff, but there's also resistance in terms of no one, but people don't much like these enormous holes being very near to them. And we're gonna need more of them in the future. I mean, I, th I think I read the claim, I come from North Wales, and I, I think I'm right in saying, there's a t there's a network of uh, copper mine tunnels yes. which date back to Roman days. Yes, yes. And I, th I think I, it, they claim they were the biggest copper mine in the world at the time. Yes, uh, but certainly there's no. Sense no I think of, that's uh, right. That's right. They were they were yeah. enormous, and then a lot of yeah. that copper was get sent to Swansea to be refined. Uh, yeah. And so Swansea for a period was the world's biggest refiner of copper, or I think it pretty much all metals. Um, and so, and played played quite an interesting role in in the, the development of of the world. I mean, the reason actually. So when you look at the, the, all these metals exchanges, like the London Metals Exchange, the reason that um, a lot of their prices are quoted in in, in kind of for three months out. So you've got three months futures. The reason it's three months is that that's the amount of time it took to sail from Chile to Swansea 
in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that convention has just has just stuck. And so right. in strange ways, we, we and I, I, you find that kind of throughout when you're looking at all of these things. I mean, salt is the one I, I kind of a bit obsessed with salt because of, of, of all the materials in, in the book. It's it's probably the one that people are most like, or so what? But with 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 salt and, and for that matter, with kind of copper, we, we find ourselves kind of retracing the steps of our ancestors, you know, for the stuff that seemingly is the most advanced things that you could kind of get these days, actually there's quite a lot of ancient uh, knowledge and processes and, and, uh, uh, and trends that are going into to making them, which, which I love, you know, that's, that's part of humanity. We've always been doing this stuff and we're going to do it in the future. And hopefully though, we can do it in a way that is more enlightened than in the past, because that's the issue. It, it could be quite dirty. I'm going to ask you about each substance and you, you already talked a bit about some of them, but just before that, can you, Tell us whether when you met all the men and women on these huge projects, digging this stuff up and processing it and dealing with the dangers and the difficulties, did you did, did they have anything in common? I mean, did, were they a group of people you'd not really come across out of thought? And what, what did you think of them? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, the, the, this is generalising enormously, of course. But for the most part, a lot of the people that you find working in these sectors. So, you know, I looked at mining, I looked at manufacturing, engineering, uh, all of these things. And also, to some extent, technology, because it's about it's not just about getting something out of the ground. It's about turning it into something amazing. So one of the things I kind of did was try and tra trace the the journey of, uh, of silicon to become a silicon chip. But I think the common factor that a lot of people, these people have is they're generally not very showy. You know, they're generally kind of, you know, quite phlegmatic and scientifically oriented. You know, there's there's people like me, you know, journalist who flounces around and tries to get attention. Well, it couldn't be more opposite, you know, that these 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 people are just doing doing their jobs um, and not really making much fuss about it and not actually trying to get much attention. So the weird thing that I encountered a lot of the time was that I was I'm used to kind of calling up various kind of companies and saying, oh, well, hi, here I am. Can I come and visit your, your, your factory or whatever it is? And for the most part, there's a kind of well-oiled machine that allows you to do that. But, and, you know, people have got press offices, they've got kind of various agencies and you, you, you go through these things and eventually you find your way to the factory and then you can kind of tell the story about it. But, but a lot of this kind of material world, they just don't like attention at all. So I was going to places that no journalist had visited, not necessarily because I was the most intrepid of all journalists, but just because you know no one paid that much attention to something like the the chemicals processing that you do to salt, um, and yet that is at the foundation stone of of how we kind of clean ourselves, how we keep ourselves healthy, um, and I mean a lot of these people. So I spent a lot of times with the chemical sector. And a lot of these people just kind of just want to keep their heads down. And I think partly that's because, generally speaking, if you work, for instance, in chemicals or to some extent in mining, generally speaking, you'll be in the press when something goes wrong. You know, so when there's some terrible explosion or a kind of chemicals leak or there's been an accident at the mine. So a lot of your kind of training is basically just don't engage at all. But I think that's problematic because part of the reason, you know, I, th I think if we're going to get to to net zero in a kind of sensible way, we need to be honest with ourselves about what it involves and be honest with ourselves about, about what we already do to get materials out of the ground. And I think our, our kind of education has, in that has, has, has deteriorated in recent years. And I think partly that comes back to the last thing, which is that, you know, I spoke to a lot of people in these industries, but what's actually quite striking when you go to, you know, an oil refinery or a chemicals plant or even a mine is that these days there's very few people working in them. You know, a lot of these places feel almost like empty spaces because, you know, they're so mechanized, they're so automated. Um, and part of the, the explanation for why, you know, um, copper is quite a small part of, of, of GDP is that we've managed to kind of start getting it out of the ground at incredibly cheap rates. And part of the explanation for how we've managed to get it, to keep it really cheap is that you have just fewer and fewer people working on it in bigger and bigger trucks. And the same thing with chemicals and the same thing with, you know, with even silicon chips. There's, there's, there's these, these fabs, these fabrication plants in, in, in Taiwan where they make the, the, those most advanced semiconductors, the things that are, you know, in your smartphone probably right now. Um, those places, you know, these days they're trying to work towards um, fabs, which they call light out, lights out fabs, where basically, 
you can have no humans there whatsoever. You know, everything is just robots whirring these kind of silicon wafers from one machine to another, totally automated, these little strange machines that kind of hang from the ceiling. And there, there is a strange, it is kind of surreal from that perspective. There's, there's fewer humans than you, than you would rather, than you'd, you'd expect or rather like, as it's, for me as a journalist, as a writer, I found that kind of a challenge. But that's, you know, that's, again, that's the nature of the world. And that's the kind of wonder of how we've managed to, 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 to keep this stuff cheap and, and ubiquitous. Um, and it's, it's thanks to that that we have the, the civilization that we can all enjoy. I've mentioned the the six substances you've got: sand, salt, iron, copper, oil, lithium. I mean, yeah, it's an obvious question, which is why those six and you know, gold, platinum. Uh, yeah, isn't, yeah. Isn't cobalt a thing there? Uh, cobalt, you know, so, yeah. Silver, uh, aluminium. Right. <laughs> so really, you just, you, I mean, yeah, you 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 have a, a big book, and it couldn't be that much bigger. Well, it's part, to be honest with you, it is partly that. There's just a lot of. I, I wanted to be able to go into them in, in enough depth, you know, and, and and each of these each of these materials uh, could and indeed has in pretty much all of the cases, you know, got big books about that specific material, mm-hmm. um, and so. There's there's just kind of the pragmatic kind of reality of being able to fit it into a reasonable like, kind of shape. I, 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 I can hear Material World 2. Well, I mean, <laughs> if it sells enough. If it sells <laughs> enough, there's definitely... Well, you know, because like aluminium's fascinating. Uranium, I mean, there's no uranium in there. And I think that's, you know, uh, the nuclear I basically don't touch and I would have liked to have. But again, it's just such an enormous topic so but but i think the kind of the broad point of it was that and gold is actually quite a good example and i talk about this in in the introduction gold is is is, it's very important for certain kind of fringe uses so it's got important medical uses in certain medical devices um it's it's important in certain types of electronics but the vast vast majority of what we do with gold once we get it out of the ground is either put it into jewelry or make it into gold bars that then sit underground again so we kind of pluck it up from underground and then put it down underground again and um you know contra- controversial as this may be to certain people in in the financial community I, like i i think civilization would not grind to a halt if we suddenly didn't have gold and so part of the objective of this was to to kind of ask the question well what are the things that that civilization would grind to a halt if we didn't have and the the kind of the challenging thing i found you know i i i I spend a lot of time looking at data in my day job and usually I'm kind of, there's, there's, there's some sort of a spreadsheet or a table you can find that basically gives you the kind of the answer as to what is the most important X or Y. Um, but in this case, there was nothing, there was no spreadsheet. And in, 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 you know, paradoxically, as I was saying, when you look at GDP, most of this stuff, the, the kind of material world that I'm, I'm, I'm writing about takes up a very small part of, of GDP. Um, and so I kind of found myself just basically having to talk to a lot of people, uh, both from geology, from science, from business, from the whole spectrum, as many people as I possibly could, who you know, knew much more than me about this. I'm very much an outsider to this world, um, to try to discern which which materials to choose. And it's not, yeah, it's not definitive, but I think there is a kind of arc that that you know that you'll see in the book, which kind of takes you from the basics and the stuff that we very first learned how to do through to the the kind of the future so the energy transition and and i and actually along the way so oil and, and lithium are the only materials and oil i kind of i put i squidge uh gas into that chapter as well that they are the only kind of explicit energy substances but really coal does make a big set of cameos throughout this because coal you know coal and iron their story is totally intertwined wood is there because you know there's a story of wood as, uh, along the way as well um and so so each of these i just found that this this was kind of enough to give you a sense of of the basics of the foundation yeah. stones for our world uh, i mean it's it, yeah it's, it's it's obviously i imagine quite a hard book to write because you could go on forever you know with interesting things and, and you're really selecting yeah. interesting things about these uh substances so let, let's just sort of run through them maybe just have one or two uh little vignettes about each of these things and on the on sand, I mean, the bit that I was totally unfamiliar with was this quartz from the US. Mm. Can you talk us through that? Ultra high purity quartz, yeah. So, so essentially, there's this mine, a place called Spruce Pine in North Carolina, uh, and what they just to, due to a kind of geological freak, 
they have the world's biggest resource of something called ultra high purity quartz. It's a type of silicon, basically, but it's 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 incredibly pure. It's very white. They actually use the the some of the kind of offcuts. Uh, they grind them down and they use them. They send them to Augusta, the the national course in America, to become the bunkers. So there's very very white bunkers that you see uh, in the Masters uh, in the U.S. That's that's spruce pine. Uh, quartz, but the really pure stuff um, goes to become these very special crucibles, and these crucibles, which you which you're using to kind of like in which you melt down kind of the silicon that later becomes silicon chips. Basically, um, this is the only way that you can make incredibly advanced silicon chips these days. You need to make the wafer in the crucible, um, and this place has the only kind of large scale supply of this stuff in the world. So everyone else, you know, including China, who is making silicon chips right now, needs spruce pine quartz in order to melt down their silicon and turn it into the wafers that later become the silicon chips. So there's Yeah, well I was really surprised by that because you know we've heard so much about the US fears of of not you know not having enough control of silicon chip production that Taiwan's got too much or China's catching up that the is it the Dutch who have this machine that no one else has got and that the uh, there are these strangle points that uh, the international community or the West anyway is is trying to um, you know, exploit to control this. And yet you're, you're saying in this, which I, I, mean, I was really baffled by this, that the US has this crucial substance and no one else has it. Mm. And yet, it, presumably, it is exporting it to Taiwan and China and everywhere else. Yes, no, it is. It is. It's, 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 it's of all of the pinch points in the kind of silicon chip supply chain. And it's a massive supply chain. Like I say, what, one of the things I tried to do in this book that, as far as I know, had, had never really been done before was to try to tell the story not just of what happens to silicon chips in those those whizzy factories in Taiwan where they are kind of made into pretty much the finished product, because that is amazing and that's part of this story, but also what happens before. So in order to make the silicon wafer, in order to get this, literally just get the physical silicon out of the ground and turn it into something that's incredibly pure, which is a silicon wafer, which is then imprinted with all these transistors and chopped up and then turned into the chips. And that process is A, kind of amazing, but B, yeah, I mean, like, America is surprisingly dominant in many stages of that. And actually, I think, you know, clearly there's been, a, it's, it's, it's an incredibly sensitive sector because silicon chips are the centre of not just the technology sector, but also the future of military. So you need, you're going to need kind of very, and, and also AI and all of these things. Um, so all of these fronts that are very strategic come back to silicon chips. Um, and so America is clearly understandably kind of nervous and paranoid about its inability so far to make the very advanced uh, chips. But if you look, save for that bit at the very end, so the, the story there is that Intel, um, obviously the US chip maker, is still unable to, to make the very, very smallest transistors. So these kind of like, the, the, they call them two or three nanometer chips they're not really two or three nanometers by the way that's a kind of just a naming convention but this very smaller stuff um intel just hasn't really mastered the technology which comes back to like you say these special machines they make in the netherlands a company called asml however when you look just more broadly across the the silicon supply chain america is the the kind of common factor so there's there's various things make it when you're making wafers when you're making the machines that make the wafers when you're making the machines that make those silicon chip uh, silicon uh, the quartz uh, crucibles america actually has uh, a foothold in pretty much all of those supply chains so why haven't they exploited that more well i think they have but i just don't uh -huh. think people talk about it much but I think there's a, you, you've got to contrast that with, with something like batteries, where China is massively in the lead. So batteries, China is massively in the lead. Solar panels, China is massively in the lead. And there, you know, there is a serious you know, question mark about whether America can actually do it. With, with silicon chips, I think, but I think there's two principles. First of all, you could never, like, and I say this having kind of traced this supply chain, you could never expect to do all of this in one country because it's just so vast, the amount of different processes you're doing. It's so complex. Um, like I say, the only place that can make the machines uh, that can imprint those tiny transistors onto, onto silicon wafers 
is a Dutch company. And actually, the Dutch company is entirely reliant on lasers that are made by a German company. And those German com- that those those lasers bounce the kind of laser beams off lenses that are made by Zeiss, another German company. So actually, you know, sup- there's surprising kind of stories in there, one of which is to say, Actually, there's, there's European country, companies which are quite important when it comes to silicon chips, and no one really is kind of very aware of that. But the other is to say that um, right now America is more dominant than it would have you believe when it comes to to, to silicon. It really is. Um, it's just that final stage. And I think it's also the fact that this is this is a technology that China has been very, very, very desperate to try to exploit and has been putting incredible amounts of money into it. But it's very it's very difficult to make a kind of very detailed silicon chip and and China is struggling to do it. They're still quite a way behind, a few generations behind um, where Taiwan is. Um, But but yeah, so far, um, the only places which can actually do the incredibly advanced lithography are um, TSMC in Taiwan and um, Samsung in South Korea. And and that's that's the bit that America hasn't yet cracked. But I would say it's probably it's quite plausible that it cracks it in the next few years and I think yeah it's it's perhaps intentionally kind of quite underrated when it comes to its dominance in this in this sector it, it is quite dominant especially also with the kind of design side of it so designing uh, the the computer design that goes into making some of these chips you've still got m- American companies that are massively uh, influential there. Now then, your, your next substance, salt. Now, I've got to be honest here, if I was your editor, I'd have, think I'd have said, eh, salt, yeah. a bit less on the yeah. salt. Oh, did, uh, what, um, yeah. what was the most interesting thing you thought about? You I think found my, about my editor probably did. And then, they, <laughs> and, then they, and then they heard about it. I think the thing is, like, it's, so part of it is history, okay? And salt has this fascinating history because, you know, it was, it was up until relatively recently, really seen as very valuable. You know, people used, used to use salt as a kind of currency, um, and it was taxed, and there were monopolies over salt. Um, when you look at Indian independence, that the, the kind of symbol that Gandhi chose um, there was salt, because the Indians had been essentially banned from making their own salt, and they had to import it in from the UK. Then, if there's one thing that we need just to survive on a kind of biological basis, it is salt. And so, whoever was able to control the trade of salt was able to control countries so this there's a kind of quite big historical side of it but actually in a way the bit that I kind of like because it's kind of unexpected again is that even today salt is still the basis for pretty much any chemical product certainly kind of the non-organic ones so non-oil related ones salt is basically the starting point for pretty much all chemicals so we we take salt and when then we we turn it into soda ash and soda ash is incredibly important for basically making a whole load of things you can't make paper without soda ash you can't make glass without soda ash it's just one of those like building block chemicals that that, that we all need or we're all screwed and the same thing with um caustic soda these 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 products and kind of materials when you put them together allow us to to make the bleachers that clean the world so without salt we can't you know have the 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 sanitary standards that we all need without salt you can't have the chlorine that you need to purify water one of the striking places i went to was the one plant and it literally is the one plant in the uk which makes all our chlorine it's kind of staggering isn't it this kind of semi-monopolistic thing but again no one ever spends much time thinking about salt or indeed kind of the, what they do there so so they don't pay much attention to it but there's this single plant which is just in Runcorn um, just on the banks of the of the, of the Mersey um, this single place makes 98% of the chlorine that goes in, around our country and they said and it uses an incredible amount of electricity because what it is it's basically electrolysis you take salty water and this is so so the, the salt is underneath Cheshire um, and by the way that's the other fascinating thing about this when you look at on a map of the UK uh, or for that matter, the US um, or, or other countries, uh, where the chemicals companies are, they are invariably above the salt deposits. So in, in the UK, a lot of our chemical firms are found in Cheshire and some of them are found kind of a tea side because there's salt under the ground there. And that's because they literally, they, they, they get the salt from under the ground. You don't, you don't mine it physically with, with axes anymore. You kind of send down 
uh, water and the water kind of comes up with the salty brine uh, uh, from, the, from the bottom. Um, but that salty brine is then turned into, into the chlorine through these electrolysis cells in, in, in run corn. And that enables them to make a few things, one of which is, is, is chlorine, another is hydrogen. You can make caustic soda out of it, you can make bleach. Um, it uses about as much electricity as the city of Liverpool. So a single room is using as much, uh, a single room is using as much electricity as the city of Liverpool. And the guys there that said, again, you know, people that don't usually like talking to the, the media, but they said, if this place goes down, then within seven days, we are rationing drinking water in the United Kingdom because there just is not chlorine. And you can't ship chlorine very, no one likes to ship it because it's incredibly dangerous. It's, it's you know, it's, it is a kind of chemical weapon uh, or has been used as that in the past. Um, so salt, salt is still the backbone, even today, of, of, of pretty much everything else. And, you know, we we'll could talk about lithium in a bit, but the way that we make lithium, for instance, in Chile is, is, is partly similar, it's basically similar to how we, the Phoenicians used to make salt back in the Mediterranean uh, thousands of years ago. Does every country on earth have salt? Is there anywhere that doesn't have salt? Well, pretty much. Pretty, yeah, pretty much. Except that there's the seawater salt, and that's that's a bit more tricky to to kind of uh, to get salt out of because you just need it's much less it's much more dilute. You know, um, it's kind of I think it's about three three percent, whereas brine that you get out of the ground. So if you pump water down into a, to a salt cavern, as they do, it's quite a spooky thing, by the way. So under the ground in Cheshire, you know, basically the salt mines in this country are under these lovely rolling hills of Cheshire. And I, I kind of went there and I stood where the salt mine is beneath us. And all there is on the surface is this kind of pipe that's going down, sending water down, and then up comes, you know, and a bit of pressurized air, and up comes this incredibly salty stuff. It's about 30% salinity, I think, uh, 20, 30%. And, and what's spooky about it is the size of these caverns is enormous. They're kind of like, it's big enough, said the guy, to hold Blackpool Tower, it's 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 massive and incredibly wide as well. These big holes under the ground that you know are there, but no one's ever seen inside them because they are kind of just being remotely mined, um, and yet they are kind of beneath beneath our feet. But yeah, no, pretty much most countries have have obviously either either access to kind of mineral salt or or the um, or the sea, and we are never going to run out of salt. There's so much to ask you about all these things, but just quickly on that and those mm. big holes under the ground, why, why don't they collapse? Well, because they used to. That was the thing. So back in the kind of early days of salt mining in, in, in Cheshire in the kind of, you know, 18, 1900s, um, that, that's exactly what happened. People would, would kind of do what they call bastard brine uh, wells. And, and essentially they would, they, kind of like you see in, in, um, in uh, the DRC at the moment with cobalt mining, you know, they literally go into their backyards and they start digging, or in, d in this case, just kind of sending down water and then pumping up the brine. And the upshot of that kind of uncontrolled mining was that you had all these big holes under the ground, some of which collapsed. And so you've got, there are a lot of places in Cheshire still today where you have big question marks about whether there are going to be big sinkholes because under the ground are all these massive holes. And actually when they were kind of planning to, to, to get the HS2 routes between Birmingham and Manchester, it was going to go right through those salt fields. And part of the difficulty of it was having to try and build the viaducts they needed to do because they couldn't go over the salt, the ground because it wasn't considered all that solid because of all the salt mining that had happened in the past. One thing I should say, though, is that um, that's your kind of previous question. Actually, the UK has quite a lot of salt and it has quite a lot of salt in the right places. So it's got salt in Cheshire, but it's also got salt kind of uh, like Teesside around there. And why does that matter in the future? If we're going to be kind of making lots of hydrogen for future energy, which we might do, hydrogen's kind of it seems to be a big part of at least some of the plants. If not fuel boiler, then certainly for kind of like backup of the grid. You need to store that hydrogen somewhere. And so far, the best place that, that geologists have found to store it is in these big salt caverns. And the UK actually, it turns out, has quite a lot of these salt caverns in the right places. So does Germany, but for instance, France doesn't have much in the way of salt storage. There's most many countries, other countries in Europe don't have much in the way of salt storage. So it turns out that in future, where the salt lies could well be a kind of an integral part of understanding who is going to be able to, you know, be a leader in these new fields of, of, of green technology. And I think I think I'm right in saying the British Library keeps its its you know, most of the books it can't keep in London because there are so many of them. 
It keeps them in a salt mine in Cheshire. Oh, does right? it? Yeah, no. Poss yeah, there is one. In fact, I, I visited that one at Winsford. So, they, yeah, I didn't know uh -huh. the British Library did that, but I know they store a lot of documents because it's quite, you know, it's quite dry in the conditions. It's dry. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 pretty yeah. good. For that. Right. Well, let's crack on because we, we're only on substance yeah. two. This a, is the problem. A quick word on a quick <laughs> word on iron. Uh, I'll, I'll just one well, point about iron. Okay. All right. Quick, quick thing on iron. Uh, it is. It is. You know, if it's not made of iron. It's made with iron. Basically, everything you touch on on a daily basis will have used will have either been made of steel. It is basically still the main metal that we have in the world, or it would have had steel tools, been made with steel tools. And we massively underplay how important iron is. It is the backbone of our ability to do anything. You know, whether you're building high speed rail, whether you're making buildings, you know, all has steel in it. It all has massive amounts of it. And our ability, I'd say, final thing, I'll be quick on steel, sorry. Um, our, our, uh, often people, economists talk about kind of GDP per capita. I quite like, and there's more, more on this in the book, I quite like to look at steel per capita because if you, if you kind of toss up the amount of steel that is around you in your daily life, so it be it in your car, in the house that you live in, uh, in the hospital that you might uh, go to, in the schools, in the, you know, the high-speed rail infrastructure, the subways, all of that stuff, if you toss it all up, in, in the UK and in much of Europe, it's about 15 tonnes of steel per capita. Um, so that is a pretty good metric of our, you know, of our kind of well-being, actually. Better in some ways than GDP. Same thing in the US, about the same amount, kind of 12, 13, 14, uh, 15 tonnes per capita of steel. If you go to somewhere like China, it's eight tonnes per capita. If you go to sub-Saharan Africa, it's under one tonne of steel per capita. So you get a sense of how some places have a massive deficiency in terms of the infrastructure around them, just by looking at how much steel they have kind of baked into the world around them. And the worrying thing is that there is still no way of mass producing steel at a reasonable price without emitting crazy amounts of carbon dioxide. You need coking coal to do it. You put it into blast furnaces. It's really, really carbon intensive. Um, and, you know, so if these, if particularly kind of sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of Asia, some parts of South America are going to get the living standards that they, you know, deserve, then it will take a lot more steel to do it. So we're going to have to make a lot more steel. And so far, we haven't worked out a way of doing that without spewing lots of carbon into the atmosphere. So it's a, bit, a little bit scary. You spoke a bit about copper at the beginning, and I'm just going to ask you one question about it. I, I read that China has really made an effort to try and control the copper market to to you know get copper. Uh, is that right? And how impressive is their control of copper? Well, they don't. The interesting thing about China is that in almost all of these cases, China does not have a very good endowment of, of, of minerals, but it has become very big when it comes to, to refining these metals. So I'd say with iron, for instance, China's been trying for, for decades to, to, to build up its own iron ore mining sector, but it's, it's still completely reliant on Australia uh, for, for iron. So again, those interrelationships, the reliances, uh, they haven't gone away. Um, with copper, yeah, China, China is the world's biggest refiner of copper. The vast majority of it, if not pretty much all of it, comes from elsewhere, gets shipped into China, uh, and then gets turned into whatever it is. And partly that's because their demand for copper is very high because they're making a lot of electronics, they're making a lot of, they're, they're urbanizing quite quickly and you need a lot of copper for the wiring going into homes. Um, but partly it's just because that's, the, you know, that's the way that the world works. And, and going back to Swansea, China is basically the Swansea of the 21st century. They have become the refiner in chief of copper uh, from around the world and doing, you know, doing basically the same thing that we used to do in Swansea, uh, but at an even, even more massive scale. Uh, oil. Now, then, mm. I, I guess the, you know, the question, which, as, as an economist, you, you, you know, give a good, a good answer to it, is, is when is peak oil? What is peak oil, and 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 when is it coming? <laughs> it depends whether you mean peak consumption or peak uh, demand. I, you know, it used to be. Uh, sorry, peak, peak, peak supply or peak demand. It used to be like when people talked about peak oil, they were kind of worried about us running out of oil. Um, I don't think that's any longer a concern, partly because of the the, the the fracking revolution in the US. And then partly because it's it's really now about peak demand. You know, just, just the other day, the International Energy Agency put out their latest um, kind of outlook of, of the global energy system. And they're talking about kind of by 2030, you're going to see demand for a lot of fossil fuels starting to tail off. Um, and that is as people are getting more electric cars, uh, as we are kind of seeing more heat pumps, all of this stuff, 
um, as we're doing that electrification that you, by the way, need all of that copper for, um, that means you potentially don't need as much oil. But the misconception here is that this is going to happen kind of quickly. In fact, you know, it's going to be a very drawn out process. It's going to take a very long time. We are still going to be very reliant on oil for a long, 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 long time. Even in 2050, you know, that kind of magic net zero year, our oil consumption is still very high. And it's just that we're kind of offsetting a lot of that. And the other thing, you know, with oil, one, it's not just, you know, what we take out of the ground to burn. That's the, you know, traditionally, we've, we've taken most of the oil out of the ground and we burnt it in our engines. In future, we're hopefully going to be doing more taking it out of the ground and using it to refining it into special materials that we can then make stuff out of, uh, which again is less carbon intensive, but we still need the oil. And the, the other thing that, that I just mentioned about oil, so I, I, the chapter is, is oil, but it's also kind of gas. And what, why, why does gas matter? Well, even today, still today, especially today, half of the world's population is alive thanks to nitrogen-based fertilizer. And where does that nitrogen come from? And this is literally, it is the world's life support system. We, even if we gave over all of the world's land and for organic agriculture, no fertilizers, um, basically everyone would have to go back in the fields. We'd, we'd have to, we'd have no, you know, all, all areas of outstanding natural, natural beauty would have to be kind of given over to farming. We'd have to have a lot more cattle because you need the, the, the manure to spread on the fields. Everything would smell kind of awful. Um, and I say this with reservations because I rather like organic food, but nonetheless, that's what the reality would be if you try to make the entire world organic and have no f chemical fertilizers. And even so, you'd still only be able to feed half of the world's population. Well, where does that nitrogen fertilizer that is keeping so many of us alive and ensuring that we don't have to go and work in the fields all the time? Where is that coming from? Uh, it is coming, uh, well, the nitrogen comes from the air, but it's fixed out of the air. Um, with hydrogen that we get from natural gas. So basically, the vast majority of the world's uh, nitrogen fertilizer is a fossil fuel product, either natural gas and in some cases coal. Um, and again, it, I, to me, I was quite surprised when I kind of learned the extent of this. But that is one of the most important materials in the world, um, both gas, but also the fertilizer that we use to sp sprinkle on crops and and are, are able to feed ourselves directly or indirectly with, because if you're eating chicken, that will have ha had some fertilizer in the feed that it's, uh, uh, that it's consuming. So this is, those are still fossil fuel products. We need gas to survive, to live right now. And yes, in the future, we're gonna come up with very clever ways of doing this in a green way, but it's gonna take a long time before we get there. And it's quite energy intensive to do that. And so in the short run, I think we just need to have our eyes open about, about you know, the reliance that we have in this world on fossil fuels. And it's, it's an awkward thing because, you know, clearly these are very carbon intensive products. And yet they are also part of what keeps us alive. They are literally part of our life support system. Um, and that, that, that's kind of awkward. It's interesting. Uh, and it's a challenge for the future. In reliance is a sort of theme with all these things, isn't it? How reliant we are on these products. And that's true of, of um, lithium as well, and I mean, I guess that's a more recent uh, reliance. Where, you know, why is lithium so important and where is it all? And I kind of, I should say, you mentioned cobalt earlier. I did um and ah for a while about whether, whether you know, I knew I needed to have something that was a kind of a battery technology. And the point here is, here is that lithium is the key kind of substrate within, within those batteries. But I did wonder for a bit whether I should do cobalt, because obviously with cobalt, there's a terrible story about the conditions in which it's mined in, in the DRC. Um, the vast majority of the world's reserves are found in, in one country, which is very unusual in the DRC. And so there was it, it was a it was definitely a kind of journalistically quite an, an enticing prospect. But in pragmatic terms, we can we can make batteries without using cobalt. You just got different chemistries. But you can't really, there's nothing in the periodic table that can compete with lithium when it comes to an energy storage medium. It is just kind of, you know, the, the, the very best. And actually, the interesting thing there, you know, back, back in, the, um, in the, 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 the turn of the 20th century, there were quite a lot of electric cars. So the early days of the motor age, there were lots of electric cars, there were steam cars as well, uh, and there were internal combustion engine cars. And for a period, actually, electric cars were slightly more popular uh, than, than the internal combustion engine cars. But what happened really is that those those engine cars, the petrol cars, um, managed to kind of get better. And whereas with batteries, the batteries were basically rubbish. 
in those in those early electric cars. And they were lead acid batteries. They they were not you know using kind of acids. Uh, they weren't very. They were very heavy. Uh, they didn't last very long. Um, and Thomas Edison worked for years and years and years to try and make a better battery, but struggled to do so. And really, the story of of lithium is that we it has been a kind of a whole century of experimentation uh, of exploration to to try to invent the ultimate battery. And that's kind of what's happened recently. It's an amazing story. You know, in the 1990s, in the 80s and 90s, the invention of lithium ion batteries is is such a big deal in hindsight, because that's what enabled us to have, you know, the smartphones that we have these days, and indeed electric cars. And so and still today, every single, you know, major kind of whether it's a device, or indeed, whether it's a a car, uh, electric car, they all still rely on the shuttling of lithium ions from one end, from an anode to a cathode, um, regardless of whether there's cobalt in there. So cobalt is sometimes sprinkled in alongside nickel and manganese and sometimes a few other things as an additive. But lithium is the key thing. It's those lithium ions which are going from one end to the other and enable it to charge and discharge. And so, and how we get lithium out of the ground, I mean, like, as I was saying earlier, it's kind of fascinating because in some ways it's quite ancient, but in other ways it's, you know, it is the very, it's the, it's the newest thing that we have. And we don't have much experience, whereas with copper, we, we, we have literally thousands of years of experience of mining copper. With lithium, we're just starting, you know, it hasn't really, if, if this book was written a few decades ago, it wouldn't have been included because it, it's, it you know, had a few fringe uses for like lubricants and pharmaceuticals, but not really for, for critical civilization dependent stuff. But now it is, it's at the core of everything, because if you're going to, if you're going to get all those cars on the road, if you're going to have the, the kind of battery backups that we need, you need a lot of lithium. Uh, and we are still only trying to work out. And so therefore, there are kind of big environmental and sustainable questions, and also kind of questions about the communities that we're disrupting. Because, um, these are new places that we haven't really mined much before, whether it's the kind of lithium triangle in South America, which I visit, parts of Australia as well. Um, this is, it's, it's new and quite exciting territory. It's a very clever idea for a book. And you. Uh, you, you, <clears throat> we now know that because we've just listened to you talking about it. And it's uh, you know, lots of, lots of you know, interesting material about how the world works, basically, which, which um, we probably should know, and which, until we read your book, we don't. Thank you.